I'd like to invite Nick to come to it. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, um, very good to be here. I'm a sort of, well, I live in Austria, and they, I, I feel like a fremdes Vogel, which is a kind of foreign bird or an exotic bird, because I don't have a PhD, for beginning with, unlike everybody else in the room. And um, I'm not really from this world. I've worked in humanitarian and development work my whole uh, professional career. Um, and we've been talking, I just sort of want to make a distinction between sort of outward communication, which has really been what we've been talking about a lot today, although we've now started talking about the sort of the other side to the, to the loop, and, and the inward communication part. Outward communication is all about telling people what you think they need to know so they kind of act on that information, behave accordingly. You need to understand the context and you need to message carefully and all of the rest of it. It's a whole science. Um, Inward communication has been the kind of overlooked stepchild of, of, of this process for many, for many years. Uh, I began my career at uh, UNHCR in the 1980s. I remember being during the, 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 the Ethiopian famine, uh, working in refugee camps in eastern Sudan. No one spoke to the people who'd crossed the border. We knew better. Um, that was the sort of prevailing mindset. But of course, they had an enormous amount uh, to tell us, an enormous amount uh, to, to, to offer. But that, that, that information wasn't being tapped. So come sort of roll on sort of 25 years, um, the focus of my organization is really trying to kind of tap into that intelligence, the field intelligence, if you like, trying to find out what people are thinking. And um, we de developed a methodology, which is part participatory development. Paulo Freire, the Brazilian economist, uh, Robert Chambers at Sussex University, Amartya Sen, the sort of the individual at the center of the development paradigm. But then, I think taking a, 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 a leaf out of your book, uh, Marion, we, we, we also looked at, well, who's really good at listening? And of course, the private sector is very good at listening because it needs to be good at listening. And we did a deep dive into the whole customer satisfaction industry, which evolved in this country in the 1960s. It's a fascinating story. I won't go into it now. But what we, what we, what we got from that was the importance of asking few questions, looking at people's perceptions, not constantly going after facts, asking these questions frequently so you can track them, and communicating what you learn back to people so they don't feel that they're being excavated upon. Um, so, in 2014, we were asked uh, by DFID, we've done quite a lot of work uh, in humanitarian crises with DFID, both at the uh, response-wide level, at the sector level, and individual project level, and DFID asked us to go down uh, to, um, to Sierra Leone to try and bring feedback in from the people who were, uh, potential, who were at risk. And of course, it was an extremely difficult environment to operate in because you couldn't get out and about to ask people questions. And um, our methodology is based not just on surveying people, but then making sense of the data with the people running the programs because it's a performance management tool. It's about uh, getting into conversations with those who have provided the data or the communities that have provided the input, making sense of that, uh, taking some decisions, taking decisions on follow-up action. That's very difficult in a place where you couldn't really move around. And so what we did was come up with, a, with, a, with, a, with an approach which had an, an array of survey instruments. And I'm going to go through some of the data this afternoon. So we did a citizen survey of the citizenry, the people of Sierra Leone. There's six million people in Sierra Leone. So we wanted to get a reliable sample of the country. At that stage, this was December. If you remember, the, sort of the alarm bells, well, MSF was sounding the alarm in the spring. The international community got around to listening to the alarm bells by August or September. And it took a few months for us to actually get down to Sierra Leone. And that's one of the recommendations I shall make at the end about how can we improve things. But anyway, we did a citizen survey. I'll tell you how we did it. And then we also did a frontline workers survey because it was so difficult to get out and about. There were some people who were going around driving ambulances, picking people up who had symptoms, who were doing uh, decontamination of homes, who were doing um, managing the quarantine program. So we had a frontline worker survey, and then when there were things we didn't understand, we, we thought we would follow up with additional surveys. So that was the approach. We, the, 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 the way we did it with the general population, we worked with a, an American company called Geopol, who had already in place an, uh, an arrangement with the main uh, cell 
telephone, cell phone provider in, in uh, Sierra Leone, MNT. And using their uh, georeferencing, we could really target specific parts of the country. Sierra Leone is divided into four uh, regions, 12 districts, and so we could be quite specific about where we were focusing. And as the disease contracted, we were able to bring in the focus of our sampling to those areas where the problem was still great. We did it on cell phones. We asked yes, no, don't know questions. It's very difficult to get, to get sort of detailed data uh, via SMS. And we offered uh, 50 cents uh, um, payment uh, with the, on, on the platform that Geopol operates, they can put money back on the cell phone so people know that they won't get that 50 cents unless they complete the survey, which is an important incentive to get the thing done. Um, this is a map of the country, uh, and, and the, those are the four districts in, 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 in those different colors, and the 12, sorry, the four regions, 12, 12 districts. So um, we, we um, I just explained that already. The Frontline Worker Survey, we work with Plan International, Save the Children, the um, Sierra Leone Ministry of Health, um, Welthunger Hilfe, and a few other organizations who gave us the telephone numbers of their frontline workers. So we were doing every two weeks the citizen survey and every two weeks the alternative two weeks doing the frontline worker survey. We had 450 people in the citizen survey, 300 frontline workers. So we had pretty, pretty robust samples. And um, we would turn the we would we would spend um, three days collecting the data. We would then spend the weekend uh, analyzing the data, and then we would provide it to the National Ebola Response Center on Monday morning for the Monday morning briefing. So it was real time data coming into the to the situation. So what do we look at? We look at four things. We, we these are our sort of. Um, performance dimensions. We look at relationships and there's a lot of talk about trust. And so a big focus of what we do is, is trying to understand the quality of the relationship between the benefactor and the beneficiary, so to speak, uh, between the population at risk and those who are trying to uh, help them. Uh, we look at behaviors, negative behaviors, positive behaviors, how are they being driven? Uh, we look at the quality of the services being provided, and I'll come to that in a moment, and we also try and find an outcomes question. For the general population, we asked only five questions, so you've got to try and make sure your questions are useful and that they're actionable. You can actually do something with this, this information. Um, so then we, we, we talk to people on the ground. What are the issues you need to find out about? What don't you know? And so I called up Hans Rosling. Uh, ground Truth is funded uh, in part by the IKEA Foundation. Hans Rosling is also funded by the IKEA Foundation. So I asked the IKEA Foundation to put us in touch. He was in Liberia. I was in Sierra Leone. And you, those of you who, I'm sure you all know Hans Rosling, right? Yes. Yeah. Hans Rosling is a, is, a, is a Swedish epidemiologist, doctor, statistician. And he's done extraordinary work. Um, with, with data uh, in, in, in sort of medical circumstances. He, he's pretty amazing. And he said, I said, well, what should, what should I be asking about? He said, there are only two things. This was the sort of height of the, of the, of the epidemic. I'm probably talking too much. And he, he, he said, there are two things that really matter to us, which is, um, does fear of stigmatization make people reluctant to report cases? There was a real concern he had that, you know, if people were stigmatized, they wouldn't report, and then you couldn't get to grips with the thing. And so the first time we asked this question, this was the frontline worker survey. And the we were asking the frontline worker on a scale of one to five, with five being very much. So at the beginning, there was a lot of fear of stigmatization. So this was a real problem. And there was stuff going on. There was this kind of communication going on, not tremendously sophisticated communication going on. And it clearly wasn't having much of an impact. And... Uh, uh, as time went by, a lot more energy went in to try to communicate this message more carefully. And what we saw was the next time, uh, this was two weeks later, um, and then gradually over the course of these seven weeks, the data, the data showed that actually the communications was working quite well in terms of people's, um, uh, people's uh, uh, fear of stigmatization. The other thing that uh, Hans Rosling said was, you know, our approach is to, with people who have symptoms, should go into quarantine. So we need to find out whether they are prepared to do that. And we asked this, again, frontline worker survey, do people follow quarantine restrictions? And at the beginning, in J December, not at all. And so that was, a, that was a concern, and there were a lot of efforts to try and uh, encourage people to do this. And then over time, 
things got a little better. And, and then after seven weeks, things were looking pretty good. And so I think the feeling in the N National Ebola Response Center was this is pretty good. Um, but then we had the citizen survey and we asked a similar question. We were asking a similar question to citizens. It was phrased slightly differently. It was related to what they were getting. Does lack of food and water make people worried about quarantine? And so you can see 80% of people said, yes, it did at the beginning. So that, rather, that matched the frontline worker. And then as the same weeks went by, the level of concern remained the same. And so there was, really, there was clearly an issue here. There, there were two data streams, and what, what, what should we be responding to? And because we couldn't get out and about to, to sort of dig into this as we normally would have done, we launched another survey, which is of people in quarantine, which is easy to do because people in quarantine have cell phones given to them by the people who are running the quarantine program. So that we, so, and it was great, no teachers, all the teachers were, uh, no, no schools were open, so we had lots of teachers on the phones calling the frontline workers, calling the people in quarantine, they, and they were very well trained and very good at it. And so we asked them in the quarantine survey, we moved from perceptions here to facts. Did you, they got two packages when they were in quarantine. The quarantine lasted 21 days. Did you receive your food package within 48 hours of quarantine starting? Fantastic, absolutely. Did you receive a repeat package during the, during the period? Zero percent of the people we called. And we were calling 100, 100 places, 100 homes every week. And then the people got really concerned and tried very hard to improve things, and things got worse. And then they gradually, gradually started getting better. And then this is four weeks later. Are your, uh, are your family's needs for food met? No, 29 percent, yes. So that was a very good result. But then. Are your families' needs for water being met? No. They, were, they had enough drinking water, but they didn't have enough water for cooking or for washing. So this was another thing that came out of the survey. Um, are your families' needs for medication met? No. People were in quarantine, and they were really worried that if they got a cold or a sore throat or a headache, this would be counted as an Ebola symptom, and they'd be shipped off to, 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 to one of the, the places where they didn't want to go. Uh, and so that was a real issue, and again, this data helped people focus on that. Um, this was another thing. By the way, the way we asked these questions, we, 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 initially when we were testing the questions, we did a lot of question testing. We were, we were saying, do you do this? Do you do that? And people were saying, yes, yes, of course I do it. But then we did the indirect form of, of, of questioning, and then people, of course, were much more honest. So do other households in your area um, comply with quarantine restrictions? And you can see not very much at the beginning. And then we, w then we asked a follow-up question. What's the main reason people don't respect quarantine restrictions? This is the frontline workers. And the frontline workers said, security is not in force. You should be keeping them in these quarantined places. And, um, and then this is what they were doing in Liberia. And it hadn't proved to have worked very well in some instances in Liberia. And we then asked the people, what makes people stay in quarantine? And they said it's messages about it's in the community's interest. And so then the messaging was on this issue rather than putting people outside with sticks to keep them in quarantine. Um, to other householders, so you see that it was, this, is the, this is the trajectory of people's views on that issue. Then I'm going to go very quickly here because I know we're running out of time. So this was, a, this was an outcomes question. So we started asking this when we started doing the, question, the, the surveys in December. Overall, is the Ebola response making progress against the spread of the disease? And you can see there was this kind of upward trajectory. And people said, but that's just what they think, and what do they know? I mean, they're just like people you're asking this question to. But then what was super interesting was when uh, UNMIR got its act together and was really sort of crunching the data on, on the number of new cases, we were able to overlay the number of new cases reported in the same week of the perceptions. And you can see there's an interesting sort of correlation between those two uh, data points. Um, we kept following things, uh, and we started changing the questions as the issues changed. So do people still follow protocols in, on Ebola, like washing hands? And you can see as the, the, the intensity of the crisis was diminishing, people stopped doing the kinds of things that would prevent them uh, getting sick. Um, and this was a big issue. Uh, in your opinion, has gender-based violence increased since the onset of the Ebola crisis? So there was a real, the real issue around gender-based violence, and this data helped people realize that this was an issue and to begin to try and deal with it. Um, and then are you facing discrimination or exclusion from your neighbors 
after being in quarantine. Initially, not at all, but then discrimination grew. So this was another issue to try and dig into to understand what was going on. Okay, so what we've seen is that collecting data is not complicated. Uh, even in a place like that, you can find ways around it. It's the relatively easy part. Um, um, and the, the, the really key thing is coming up with a strong sampling strategy. I have a chief statistician who does have a PhD in statistics. And so our sampling strategies are very strong. And you need to have quality data because otherwise people don't really consider it. Um, how do you get action? These are the three things I was asked to talk about. How do you get action? You need to have incentives in place. You need to communicate the results of this stuff effectively. We did this briefing every Monday morning to the National Ebola Response Committee. We sent emails with the data. It was just three pages, very, very brief, all uh, extremely visual, very little text. Just, you know, the, 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 the visualization of the, 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 the information was quite, quite strong. We were asked, please make recommendations. We said, well, we're not subject matter specialists. We're just looking at the data. And they said, well, it helps us think it through. We can totally disagree with what you recommend. And it sort of stimulates the conversation. So we started writing recommendations. Some people want, want, want us to do that. Some don't. Very important interoperability of data with other uh, of this data with other data sets. That wasn't well done in Sierra Leone. Hopefully in future crises it will be. So you can do the kind of correlations that I showed you earlier. Um, and you need a sort of transparent culture that welcomes this kind of information, which may show that you're doing things well, and it may show that you're doing things not so well. So it's, it's very important not to be uh, concerned about what this is telling you about your performance, but to try and use it to improve your performance. How to improve? Don't reinvent the wheel every time a crisis strikes. It took us four months to get there because there was a, it, this wasn't provided for. What we need to do is we need to have engagement and communication hardwired into emergency responses. Because if you have to kind of put together a hard team at the last minute and you don't have the financing for it and so forth and so on, it's going to be very difficult to get off the ground um, quickly. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you. <laughs>